Hi everyone, my name is Minister Barry Haggerty. Welcome to Kings, where we experience life with people, power, and purpose. Thanks for taking your time to be here with us today, either in person or online. If you happen to be a guest here today, you can text NEW to 907-357-2065 and fill out the digital connect card. And take that confirmation email that you get to the next steps desk where you'll receive a free gift. So in Mark chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus has gone by this fig tree that is supposed to have fruit, have the signs of fruit, but there were none. And he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you. In the context and in the way that Mark is writing this, I believe that he's talking about even the, the religious system of the day, because you have the clearing of the temple that happens in between all of this. And I think it's one of the ways that he's trying to say this religious system is supposed to be producing fruit, but it's not. It's supposed to have life, and it's not. It, it, it just, it, it's not producing anything. And so they come by in the next morning, in verse 20, and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. So it, it's, he, he takes this singular thing that happened, and now he begins to apply it. And he's like inviting the disciples in on this. Truly I say to you, whoever says, you and I are, are whoever, right? That, that includes you and me in this. Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for just what you want to do in this night. I thank you, Lord, that you're breaking off even a spirit of heaviness, even of people that have received even prophetic words that are now facing situations and they have no idea, they're like, what is going on? That you're bringing clarity, that you're bringing victory, that you're releasing power even now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for that, Lord. Amen. There's a few principles here that, that we find. Again, everyone knows that in this church, you, you live it, actually. You can't be part of Kings without living and knowing this. I just want to point out a few things. When you receive your word, one of the things that it, you know, you know God gives you a language to, 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 to speak. He gives you the vocabulary of victory. In every season that you're facing, God will always give you a way to how to face that season. And he gives you the words for that moment. Sometimes it's even a song. There'll be a song that in a season has a specific meaning and it just simply, it just connects with you. It connects you to the Holy Spirit. It just is beyond the song. Think about even moments where you've been touched by God, moments where, where there's been a special visitation. A lot of times there's songs that have been associated with that. You hear that song, it brings you back to that moment. It, there's just that association. It's just in that season, God gives you the words in every season that you need to use to be able to come into victory. The, the easiest thing is just simply to, to set back and to complain and to point at all the problems. And what God does is, I, I need to help you change your vocabulary because the way that you're going to go forward, it's voice activated, like Pastor Daniel was speaking this morning. So you need to have the right code, if you could say it that way. You need to have the right words on this. Not in a formula, but just words of faith. Every season that you're facing, God will give you a language um, that, that's going to connect you or take you to victory. And when you receive your prophetic word, what you do, that, that's how you war, wage your war. You take that very prophetic word that was given to you, and, and you, can, you listen to it. You know, you digest it. You think about it. You begin to even maybe imagine what it will be like when you're actually living in the fullness of that reality that's been spoken there. And what you begin to do is begin to use the very words that were spoken there in that word, and you begin to speak uh, to that mountain. You speak to the areas of your life where there seems to be no life. You, you, you speak where, where, where there doesn't seem to be a way. You begin to speak life over that, and God begins to make the way, but he's using the very language that, that, that he's speaking right there, the prophetic word that you receive. He's giving you the weapons that you need to break through. He's giving you what you need to step into victory. And we are of those that speak to mountains. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but we speak to mountains, and we expect to see them move. So what Jesus says here is that whoever, in this verse 23, says to this mountain, 
So it's, 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 it's open to anybody. It's anybody that has the faith and does not doubt. So I think Dr. Morocco even had a sermon where faith minus doubt equals your miracle. In fact, in fact, if I could just get real practical for one second, one thing that I would encourage you to do even is if, if you have like even a notebook or just a sheet of paper, just on the top, write what your prophetic word is or one part of that prophetic word. Make a line right down the middle. On the one side, begin to write, what are, the, what are the things that are coming up in your mind that are doubts? What are the things that you go, when you hear that word and you go, it just seems impossible. There's no way. Write those things that seem no way on that one side. Make it the, the doubt side. On the other side, just write down the different verses and promises that God has. You have more than 8,000 to choose from, right? And then so then take some of those promises and now you begin to be specific in the way that you're battling and combating the doubt Doubt is like weeds. You gotta, you gotta tend to the garden of faith, right? Unbelief is whenever you just let everything go wild and you don't care about it. Doubt is when just things spring up. You, gotta, you have to deal with it even in the moment. And so there'll be moments where you're contending in faith for something. God has spoken maybe over your finances. God has spoken over your family. God has spoken over your future. And you're contending in faith. And in the process of that, there'll be times that things will sprout up. They'll be like, yeah, but what if it doesn't happen? Have you ever had even a prophetic word and then things go from bad to worse? One of the things that I've noticed, by the way, and this is just a little, a little insider trick on something here of prophetic. When somebody receives a word, like say about finances, right? God's gonna bless you financially and all this kind of thing. 90% of the time, that person's probably broke or on the way to being broke, right? And God is speaking to them, right? Because he, he doesn't speak to the, he, he doesn't, like, like when there's darkness, he doesn't go, look how dark it is. He speaks light. He speaks life. He speaks the things that are not as though they were. So he'll come to situations. In fact, there's been some prophetic words where I'm there and I know the people. And I'm hearing the word or sometimes I'm translating for them. And I'm just going like, God, are you sure that this is the right person that you know? Like, are you, I, I don't know. It's kind of like Gideon. The angel of the Lord appears to him and says, mighty warrior. And you just kind of want to be there like, are, are we seeing the same thing? Are we like... Is there something I'm missing here? But he speaks potential. I remember one time in Dallas, I was uh, getting ready to preach and these two young people were getting up to go and I felt I had a word for them and I, and I shared it and um, went on with the, with the service. And later on, I found out that they were literally getting up to go to the mall to shoplift, to steal. And they, they got caught and anyways... And so I'm there and I'm like, Lord, I kind of felt embarrassed. I mean, you know, here I am giving them this amazing word of how God wants to use them and potential and, and ministry, all this kind of different things. And uh, like, you could have helped me out here. You know, it could have maybe done a word like, hey, what you're about to do, don't do it. You know, God seeing you, you know, like be careful or it's something, right? And I felt like, I, I felt embarrassed, you know, like what are people going to think? Like, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing and all this kind of thing. And uh and I felt the Lord just say, you know what? I speak to potential. That was my intent, and that is my intent for them. And how is it going to happen unless you release it in faith and you begin to speak it? So we are of those that speak to situations. We speak to darkness, and we, we speak light. We, we speak to dry bones, and we speak life. We, we speak where there, it doesn't seem to be even a way. We speak a way into existence. That's just, that's just how things operate. It's just the principle of the kingdom. And he says, if we don't doubt, if we don't doubt, if we, and, and, and notice how even we receive things twice, right? He says, uh, whatever, you, um, whatever you ask uh, for in, in prayer, in the verse 24, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I love how it says that. Believe, have you ever had that moment where you're praying? And you just know that you have the answer, even though you don't physically have it in your hand. Or moments where God's burden will come on you, you're interceding, and all of a sudden you go, okay, it's done. It's done. And you're like, well, where is it? I don't see it. No, 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 it's, it's done. You've received it once in the spirit. You receive it a second time physically in your hand. There's just a moment where you're fully convinced of what God has said. It's, it's like Romans chapter 4, whenever it talks about Abraham. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised to do. There wasn't a doubt. It, it's interesting, though, to read actually Romans 4 in light of Genesis. When you read the story of Abraham, again, you have this thing of like, are we, are we talking about the same guy? You know, because there were moments where he doubted. There were moments where he tried to create his own way, where, where he was lying and God had to help him out. But at the ultimate time, 
test when he had to give his son of the promise, he followed through with that. And it's like God counted that as righteousness, as though everything was, was fine. I mean, God's amazing, amazing. So, so we be fully convinced that even what we've spoken, even, even this prophetic word, there'll be moments that God will speak things. And you're like, there's absolutely no way that can happen. There's just absolutely no way. And that, that's a good place to be. And part of our job, and even in, in positioning ourselves in faith, is to be fully convinced that he's able to do what he said he's able to do. James talks about this principle too in James chapter one. He says in, in verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, in the context, by the way, if you just read the context, you, you, obviously we can ask God for wisdom at any moment, and he wants to give us wisdom. I, I definitely need a lot of wisdom. In verse 2, though, it says, Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. It's, it's, I don't know if you've ever gone to counseling, but imagine doing counseling. You're like, man, I'm going through a rough time. You're like, man, I, I really envy you, right? Count it joy. Amen, I'm having more troubles today than I've had before. You know, glory to God. We don't tend to think that way. And in the context of what James is saying, he goes, if you don't see it from that perspective, ask God for wisdom, he'll give you the right perspective so that you can count it all joy when you're going through trials because there's something that's happening in the trial that wouldn't happen any other way, right? I mean, I I could go to somebody that goes into the gym, for example, and works out and everything. I'd say, could you pray for me that I have exactly your same physique and body, please? In Jesus' name. How many know that if somebody could do that, that would be an amazing ministry, right? You'd be like, hey, here I am. Now, now it, it just doesn't work. Some things are transferable. Now, I could maybe pray, you know, pray that I have the same discipline and that kind of a thing. Like, I totally have lost all my discipline on this trip. You guys have been so amazing. I, I need to bring my stretchy pants, right? I mean, I just feel like I've, I've grown in my pounds. But, but there's certain things that, that aren't going to happen unless I actually put in the work. And dis- there, there's, it, it just isn't going to happen any other way. I have to be able to be the one that does the work. Nobody can work out for me, right? I wish, I wish it wasn't so, but it, it's just the truth. Nobody can live my relationship with Christ for me. I am responsible for my own relationship and my own walk with God. I'm the steward of my own heart. So here, James is saying, let him ask wisdom. Let him ask of God who gives generously, verse 5, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith without, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And now he applies it. He takes it from this moment of speaking and asking for wisdom to, and, and applies it to everything in life. Look, look at verse 7. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. It's not that the Lord isn't giving. It's not that God is withholding something from that person. They don't have the ability and the capacity to receive what he wants to give. Because it requires faith. If, if you want to get something from God, it requires faith. You need to be in a posture of faith. It's not that God is withholding. It's like, I'm not going to give you what I wanted to give you. It, it's just that they're not able to receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Not just in this way, but in all his ways. So everything he does, this person does, is topsy-turvy. It's unstable. There's nothing that is established in their life. They take two steps forward, three steps back. You know, they they just never seem to be able to get to that final breakthrough. They get a prophetic word, and they, but they're they're unstable with it. They don't have any. They, they don't have a way to really build their life on the very word that God has given them and what He's wanting to do in their life. Because, and again, it's not God that, that's trying to stop them from doing this or making it difficult. It's that they're not. There's not this faith, an un, unwavering faith in this. So when you receive even this word, part of what the Holy Spirit is wanting to teach you and me through this, and even prophetic words, is to learn to be people of faith where we're fully convinced of what he has said. It reminds me of uh, this, um, it was a Pentecostal denomination that was meeting in, I think it was like in England, they'd have their yearly annual meeting of denomination. And they had this moment where they'd open it up for people to give their testimony. And this one sister would raise her hand. She said, I, wanna, I just want to praise the Lord that he's healed me. And she had this tumor right here on her throat, right? But it was huge and it was very evident. And she said, I just want to praise Jesus because he has healed me. Everybody goes, okay, well, amen, you know, and whatever. Next year, conference, they open it up for testimony. Same lady. I just want to praise the Lord that he has healed me. This time the goiters, you know, the, the, this tumor thing that she has is twice the size. 
I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you feel uncomfortable, right? You know, you don't know where to look and that kind of a thing. And so like, okay, all right, you know, second year, third year, same thing. Fourth year, they're just kind of going like, look, we, we understand that you're trying to be in faith and all that, but it's getting a little uncomfortable. Could you not share your testimony? We'll just agree with you behind the scenes that Jesus wants to heal you, but you know, this, it's uncomfortable for everybody. And she raises her hand, just says, Jesus has healed me. And so I think about the fifth year that she stands up and gives her testimony. This time there's absolutely nothing, you know, completely healed. And people were just amazed. And she goes, see, I told you Jesus healed me. You guys just sit and listen to me, right? It's just standing in this, in this position, in this posture of faith. And what the enemy will try to do is get you to speak in a way that's contrary to what God is wanting to do. He'll come, and it's the way that he tempted Adam and Eve. Did, did, he, did God really say? You know, Jesus, when he's being baptized, and you have this voice from heaven, this is my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased, and then he's in, in the desert. If you're the son of God, well, well, then do this. Prove it. Let's prove it to me, right? It, he comes in and causes us to question the very word that God has given. And, and in a moment like a prophetic conference, we receive things, and we're just like crying, and we're like, praise God. But then on the, the next day, on Monday or Tuesday, right, when we get back in, to the real world, quote unquote, we begin to question our experiences that we even had. Did God really say that? Was, it, was that the way that he really said it? Did I understand right what he said? It's like John the Baptist, behold the the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But then when he's in jail, he sends his disciples to ask of Jesus, are you really the Messiah? I, I, I'm not, not really sure. He was seeing it through the lens of his circumstances. And it's easy to forget that at the moment, right? It, it, in the moment we, we feel, we like, man, that, that was awesome. Holy Spirit touched me. But then when I walk outside and I'm hit with the cold outside and, and then I, I have to face the, the, the situation and it seems like it's worse before it even gets better, I begin to question that that very word. And, 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 I'm, and I'm questioning, is this mountain ever going to move? I mean, what, we, we know all this, right? Even what I'm saying here is nothing new. We, we've read this. We've understood that. My question is, what do we do when we've spoken to the mountain and it hasn't moved? What do you do then? What is God trying to do in those moments where we have stood in faith in the best of our ability and understanding, we have spoken to the mountain, we've received those prophetic words, we've even God, what he's spoken to our hearts, we're now using them even as, as weapons of warfare, but it's like that mountain stays in the same place and continues to mock us. Like, like I'm not moving. You can say all you want to say you want to say, but I'm, I'm not moving. What, what is God doing even in those moments? What, what is actually happening in those moments? I'm reminded of many years ago, there was this prophetic conference, uh, one, of the, one of the first ones that my wife and I went to. And, and again, uh, um, I remember it in a certain way. My wife remembers it, how it really happened. But um, I'm going to share my version <laughs> of this, and later on she can, she can correct it. But um, we were standing in line with, um, with, with, the, with the different prophets that were there, and um, it was at the time, Dr. Morocco had been asking us to be part of the staff for uh, two, three years. And I, just, I was just like, no, thank you. I'm good. No, thank you. But that, that time, we knew the Lord had spoken to us. And we said yes. And we, we, we spoke to him immediately because I knew if I didn't do it, I'd make up an excuse and never obey, right? I'd delay obedience. So during that time, we're, we're eating. And there was this prophet guy that was in front of us. We're standing in line. And he turns around. And he looks at me. And he kind of extends his hand. And I just feel, I, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, but I feel this sense of the Holy Spirit come on me, like presence come on me. I feel like I'm almost going to fall back. And this is my version of what happened. He said that in the next, I think it was six months, a period of time, six months, we'll just, I, now I can't remember specifics, but let's just say it's six months. God's going to provide for you financially. There's going to be checks in the mail. You know, there's just going to be blessing financially, all this stuff. And I'm like, amen, I receive it. So I go back home, we go back home, and I lose my job. I had been working as a graphic designer, making the most money I'd ever made in my life at that time, and, and had, had a you know, wonderful, wonderful job, wonderful company that I was working for, and they had to let me go. It was 2008, and all the stuff that was happening in the economy. My wife was doing her practicum, and, and she was having difficulty there as well. She was finishing her master's degree, master's in marriage and family therapy, and was also working and, and got let go of there too. So I would go in and my boss would say, hey, use any of the computers, use any of the software, use anything you want. We want to help you get on your feet. You know, we'll help you. We'll help you send out resumes. We'll help you try to get a job. Nothing is happening. Absolutely nothing. Zero, nothing. 
Like, I can't get a job at, at McDonald's. I can't get a job anywhere. No, nothing is how. I mean, I'm, I'm trying anywhere because I got I to get diapers for my kids. You know what I mean? I, I, I have to buy gas you know, for the car. I remember one time we had enough gas in the car to get to church but not get back home. And we made the decision to go to church and worship. And during the service, not telling anything to anybody, right? You know, some, some people, when they go through stuff, they're, they're, they're saying, like, indirect things to everybody. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it'd be great to have a little bit of money, you know, to get a, if only I could have a coffee, hint, hint, you know what I mean? You know, we're not, we're not saying anything to anybody. We just, we just thought, we, we, we just need to go worship Jesus. And at the end, uh, our friend was, was pastoring there, and he says, you know, you spoke at a conference and helped us out or whatever. We never gave you an honorarium. Um, I have it for you right here in the, in the, in the office. And, and here's, here's money. And I was like, praise the Lord, because I had no way of getting home. I mean, it, honestly, I, I didn't even know what I was going to do. It, it was this kind of situation that's happening. But the whole time I'm holding on to this word that I received. And I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, do you remember when he said this? She's like, he didn't say that. I'm like, no, no, no. I was there. We're standing in line. He turned around. His presence came over me. He said about the money and that she, uh, he, he didn't say that. I'm like, no, no, he did. He did. You'll see. Six months. So I'm, I have it on the calendar when this is going to be happening, right? I'm like, checks are going to start coming in the mail any moment now, and we're going to be okay. Meanwhile, things go from bad to worse, right? This whole time, it's, it's just horrible, absolutely horrible. And I have no idea what, what to do during this time. I, I, I don't understand what God is even doing in the process of this time. I, I, I don't get it. So I'm not able to really cooperate with him. I'm more complaining than anything else. I, I, I couldn't, I, I just didn't grasp it at the moment what, what was happening. And in retrospect, I can see now what was going on. So anyways, that date is coming up and the day comes and I'm waiting for the mail to come and, and all I get are bills, you know, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. I'm thinking it, maybe it's a special package that's gonna come FedEx, UPS. I'm waiting at the window, right? Because I'm a man of faith. So I'm waiting at the window, it's gonna be there. Nothing comes. I'm like, maybe I miscalculated the 24-hour period. Maybe, you know, I'm not counting the hour change in Hawaii to where I was in Minnesota. Let's just redo some of the math, give it a couple more days. But any day now, that stuff's good. Okay, long story short, I, nothing came in, absolutely nothing. In fact, our, our situation went from bad to worse, to worse than I thought it could ever go, and, and worse from there, even there. And uh, ended up going, obviously, to, to Kings and, and going to Maui. We were there for, uh, for, for about a year. Lost our home. I mean, we just, it was just horrible, horrible situation. And this whole time I'm thinking, God, you know, I, we, I, I spoke to the mountain. Come on. I'm a whoever. You said this here. I'm speaking every day to this mountain and nothing's happening. That guy, I don't even know what his name was because he never came back. Maybe there's a reason why he didn't come back. I'm just saying. I discovered that afterwards. But I'm like, the guy turned around. He looked at me, the presence. I almost fell, you know, all this stuff. And this is what I heard. And, and like, what, what is happening? What is God doing in those moments where you're contending in faith, believing for your family, for that promise? And you know that God has spoken to you, but it doesn't seem like anything is going anywhere. What happens when you speak to the mountain and it doesn't move? And many times we find that resistance when we come against the mountain and it doesn't seem to be moving, that, that, that soon we just stop speaking. In fact, it becomes embarrassing to even remember that the mountain is even there. We just, it's better to ignore it. We're just not gonna even talk about it anymore. That whole situation, find it, whatever, you know, we're just, we're just not gonna even, we're just gonna ignore it because to even bring it up and even bring it up in prayer, this is where unspokens come up, right? Anybody have a prayer? I have an unspoken. It's because it's too hurtful to have to admit that I'm in still the same situation. I've been speaking to the stupid mountain for however long and it's not going anywhere and I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I've asked the Lord over time, like what exactly is happening in this process? How, how many of you found yourself there ever? Where, you, where it's easier to get discouraged in that moment? Well, let, let, let me share to you what I, what I believe that the Lord is doing in those moments. And I came across this in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 14. This is a great verse. Great, great verse. Isaiah 40, 41 and uh, verse 14. It says, fear not, you worm Jacob. You can, you can put your name there. 
Isn't that great how he speaks? Do, do, do you know that what God is doing here is that he's, he's speaking to them at the place where they feel at the moment and how the other nations look at them. They're just worms or nothing. And he's like, I'm, I'm gonna speak to you right where you're at. You men of Israel, I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. You know, I've, I've read this before and I go, God, if you are our helper, why do we have mountains? Why have giants in the land? You know, Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome this world. In this world, you have many adversities, many troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And we're like, well, thank you? I, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, if you've overcome the world and I'm having, how, how is this compatible? What are, why are the two there together? Hey, you're gonna have a lot of trouble, but don't worry about it. I've overcome the world, so take heart. I'm like, why? Let's go to the back to, let's, let's backtrack for a moment. Let's go back to the, in this world, you're gonna have a lot of trouble. Let's revisit that for a moment. Why am I having a lot of trouble? Why does he need to be the helper? See, if he's the helper, it means that he doesn't do everything for us. He helps us through it. He's with us. He encourages us. He empowers us. He gives us the grace that we need. But like Pastor Daniel was saying this morning, he doesn't do everything for you. I remember reading Mark chapter 11 when I was a kid, and I would just pray because I had duties in the house that I had to do. I had cleaning duty, all that kind of stuff, washing dishes, duty, all that stuff. And I'd pray, believing that God would send angels so I wouldn't have to do any of it, right? <laughs> you said, Lord, whoever says, this is my mountain right now, and I command these dishes to be washed, and it just never happened. <laughs> but if I, I'm like, if you're my helper, like, help me out here, right? He says, I'm the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, now, now, now notice what he does here, verse, verse 15, because he's speaking to them at a place where they have no hope and they have no expectation of the future and even they have prophetic words and they're like, what is going on? Because they're in captivity half the time. Half the time they're, they're suffering the consequences of their own sin and bad decisions. But this is what God says, I make of you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. <laughs> You shall thresh the mountains and crush them, and you shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away. It means you're making them like fine dust that just even the most gentle breeze can carry away. And the tempest shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Lord. In the Holy One of Israel, you shall glory. Notice what he does here. And this is what I believe he's doing with us. When you speak to the mountain and it doesn't seem to move, we sometimes think, well, maybe that mountain's just gonna be there permanently and forever. God said, no, no, no. It's gonna move. It's gonna move. But I'm giving you teeth during this process and this season and this time. I'm making you sharper in your faith and in your praise and in your worship. I'm making you sharper in the way that you hear my voice. And, and this is what's gonna happen. You're not, just, you're not gonna speak to it. You're gonna become so much more powerful and bigger and stronger that what seems to be impossible, you're simply gonna come through and just cut it like nothing. It, it, you might as well just say it's like, like a hot knife cutting through butter. It's, 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 it's the same concept. It's the same idea. What seems to be impossible. See, you think like, oh, God, where are you? Where have you been all this time? I'm, I'm here contending for my family, and I'm, and I'm in this promise and this prophetic word for my healing. Where is my healing? Where is that provision? How come you bless that person, but you don't bless me? How come it falls on that other person? I know they're not living right, but it doesn't fall on me. You know, we begin to question the very character of God himself. Could it not be that simply God is making you sharper during this time? He's giving you teeth during this time so that you can cut through that mountain, what looks to be impossible. You're just gonna slice right through it like it's nothing. Isn't that what you say in Zechariah chapter four, verse six and seven? This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. What does he say? Not by mind, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you? Oh, great mountain. Who are you? 
You think you're going to stand in my way? You think you're going to be there forever? You're mocking me day after day. You're saying, look how big I am. I'm not moving. Nanny, nanny, boo-boo. Stick your head in doo-doo. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not doing anything here. He says, who are you before Zerubbabel? You shall become what? A plane. You will become absolutely like nothing, like as though you never even existed. What he's saying is that Zerubbabel will become so much more powerful and so much stronger in comparison to that mountain, that in comparison, that mountain is is just an anthill. It's absolutely nothing in comparison to what he is on the inside. And he shall bring, um, uh, he shall bring forward the top stone and uh, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. See, even during this process in time that you've been even building that church and you're like, God, come on, where's the answer? Where's the answer? Come on, where is it? You know, we've been contending, we've been praying, we've been fasting, continue doing that. But during that time, could it not be that God is just simply making you sharper than you were before? Could it not be that even the kind of person that requires to maintain that needs to be at a higher level even of faith, of sensitivity and flow of the spirit? And during this time, he just simply sharpens you. It's not that he's forgotten you. It's not that he's, he's a liar, that he said something, and then it's like, well, I'm not going to do it now, right? It's, it's that he's just, you're, you're in the process of becoming the kind of person that can just cut through anything that gets in its way. It's, it's the same thing that happened to Joseph in Psalm 105 and verses 18 through 19. The Joseph that had the dream was not the Joseph that could carry the dream at the moment. He had to go through some stuff. If he would have just gone straight to the throne, it would have just, it would have destroyed him. But it says that his feet were hurt in fetters, with fetters, and his neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord, what, what did it do? Verse 19, it tested him. It tested him. Isn't it interesting that even in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, that one of the reasons why the word of God doesn't produce fruit in our life is because it, it, we receive it with joy, but then because of the persecution, because of the word, that word persecution is offense, because of offense against even God, because he didn't meet our expectation in the way that we thought he should, because the word wasn't fulfilled in the way we thought it should be fulfilled. On our timetable, in our way, we get offended, and what we do is we just, we kill that seed. We kill the very thing that God is wanting to do in our very life. When that word, what it's doing, and it brings on that persecution, the very word brings the persecution to see if we really believe what we say that we believe. It's easy during the conference time to go, oh, praise Jesus. But it's, but it's when you're faced with the bills, what do you do then at that moment? When, when you don't seem to have the answers, when you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, what do you do then? Do you glory in the God of your salvation? Do you shout in those moments? Do you get up and you just begin to just jump? Do you begin to even dance when nobody is watching? Do you begin to even celebrate the victory beforehand? Those are the moments that make you sharper. And if you don't understand that, you can actually short circuit the very thing that God is wanting to do. He has, when he releases that prophetic word, he has that intent. He's declaring his purpose. He's making it clear. He's making it plain. But what we have to do is cooperate with that. We have to understand I'm, I'm not right now. I'm not the person that can carry this word, but Lord, I'm willing to go through the process. I'm willing to become the kind of man that does that. I'm willing to submit to whatever it is that you have. And I'll speak to my mountain and that mountain, either it's going to move or I'm going to move it, but one way or another it's going. And so it, it develops something in us where instead of being intimidated by the mountain, instead of being ashamed because we have that mountain still in the same place, all it is is to say, you just wait. You just wait. Because I'm coming after you. It reminds me of Sir Edmund Hillary, who is one of the explorers of Mount Everest. He's actually one of the ones that found one of the pathways through there. In fact, I, I believe his body's still up there. But he said in one of his attempts, first attempts to go up Mount Everest, he said, you defeated me, but you won't defeat me again, Mount Everest. Because you have grown all that you can grow, but I'm still growing. We look to our mountain and we say, you've gotten as big as you think you can get. You've shown all your cards. You've intimidated me all the ways that you can intimidate me. You've, you've shown me who you really are, but I'm growing on the inside. I'm becoming sharper. I'm growing in my faith. I'm growing in power. I'm getting more connected than I've ever been before. And mountain, move or I'll move you. But one way or another, you're not staying where you're at. You can mock me all you want. Do whatever you want to do. But I'm getting stronger. 
I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. Amen. I'm going to ask you to just stand to your feet for one moment. How many of you right now would say, I have some mountains that I'm speaking to? I want you to just begin right now, right, right where you're at, just for a moment. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to, it's this thing that weighs even on your heart that might even cause you some ulcers and keep you up at night. And you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to go forward on this. I want you to begin to speak to that thing. What some of the most prophetic and most powerful words that you can even speak will come actually from your mouth. You speaking to your mountain, I want you to begin to speak to it. I want you to just begin to just say mountain. I mean, get a little mad if you want to. You don't have to cuss, we're in church, but get a little mad at that mountain. You say, you're gonna move one way or another. You're, you're moving, you're, 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 you're getting out of the way. You will move or I will move you, but you're not staying where you're at. Things will not stay and remain the same because I'm growing on the inside. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.